Well, good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to welcome you back to our Loose Colloquium on Inclusive Excellence. Yesterday, we had such a fabulous day, and I want to thank, I see some of our faculty here who were responsible for it, Dr. Du Bois, Dr. Luce, Dr. Ray. Uh, I, I know we're gonna hear from uh, Sharon Washington, Professor Washington, a little later this morning. Uh, are there other faculty I'm missing here? Um, well, thank you. Yesterday was fabulous. I want to thank the students who participated. You were great. I want to thank our wonderful staff who have made the technology and the logistics possible. Katie Almanich is running our Zoom webinar here, and Kathleen Tolliver is taking care of a thousand details, and Phil Reese is our camera person, and Timothy Russell is taking pictures, and, and everybody is just uh, working hard to make this successful. Yesterday morning, we heard from Mariko Silver, the president of the Henry Luce Foundation, about 30 years of the Claire Booth Luce program at Trinity and how proud she is of the ways in which Trinity has created a national model for inclusive excellence. The Luce Foundation is funding this particular colloquium. And we also heard from Makita Richardson, our program officer at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute the HHMI grant was responsible for a million dollars worth of investment in developing our inclusive excellence pedagogy, supporting our science faculty in particular as they develop the methodology to move from traditional methods of teaching science to inclusive methods of teaching science in order to create larger, wider, and more effective pathways for the students we serve um, who are women of color who frequently get left out of uh, the STEM disciplines. I, I was reading just yesterday when I went back to my office, a long article about how there are so few decision makers in the STEM arena uh, who are women in general and uh, black and Latina women in particular. I really feel that here at Trinity, we are educating the next generation of leaders in the STEM disciplines um, who will change the face literally of who is in leadership uh, in academe, in business, in all of the arenas where we need to be and where our students need to be. Uh, one of the things I'll talk a little more about this morning is this is all consistent with Trinity's racial equity initiative known as Trinity DARE, driving actions for racial equity. And the very first goal of Trinity DARE is to widen career pipelines um, for Black and Latina women um, who often are not invited to seats at the table when the big companies come to town. This all started when Amazon came to town and invited a few universities to talk about um, how they would work with the universities and Trinity was not invited. So I saddled my horse and rode around with my spear and my, my flame and said, you have to have Trinity at the table. And thanks to Dean Sita Ramamurti, we got a seat at the table at the Capital CoLab and the Greater Washington Partnership and AWS. And then late yesterday afternoon, we heard from our partners um, at the Office of the State Superintendent, the DC Public Schools and KIPP and the other charter schools about how those partnerships are helping to widen the seats at the table starting in ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. So with dual enrollment and early college. So all of that was yesterday. Today, I am so pleased to tell you that we have another great partner with us in the U.S. Department of Education. I think all of us know that our students benefit greatly from the Pell Grants and the student loans and the other support of the U.S. Department of Education. In addition to that, what you may know or may not know, but we're going to talk about today, is that through the predominantly Black institutions program of the U.S. Department of Education, Trinity has received grants that now total close to $4 million, and those grants have helped to purchase the equipment in this beautiful science and nursing building, outfitting our laboratories, um, supported our faculty development to learn how to use all that technology, and also supported the development of our dual enrollment and early college programs. And this is a magnificent program, and I am just so pleased uh, that, to know that um, we have these colleagues who are going to speak to us this morning. I know that Dr. Vicki Robinson is, is on as a viewer of this, not on as a speaker, but Vicki, we welcome you and thank you for all of the great support that you are giving us through the PBI program. 
the people who do the work with us every day and all the time, and I have known them as online buddies since, what, 2016, Ms. Bernadette Miles and Mr. Shakir Davy are our program officers at the PBI program at the U.S. Department of Education. There, they're coming on the screen. And I want to start off by saying thank you, my friends. Um, it has been your support and guidance and encouragement and hard work that have made it possible for Trinity to be so successful. And I hope you will see us as one of your model institutions for the PBI program. Um, so welcome to Trinity. You can't see the whole room because you see me on screen, but the room is full of our faculty and students and they are eager to hear from you this morning. So Ms. Miles, I'm gonna introduce you and Mr. Davey, uh, I know you both have, have a PowerPoint presentation. You wanna to talk to us, tell us about the predominantly black institutions program, what the goals are, who else you're supporting, and what your hopes are for Trinity's participation. Welcome, Bernadette Miles, Shakir Davey. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us to participate today yes, um, at your colloquium. I, um, I, I, I am serve as a lead with um, Shakir Davey uh, mm -hmm. for the PBI Formula Grant Program. There is also the PBI competitive grant program, which I just, uh, as I was reviewing my notes, I have not, um, Trinity has not had a, com a competitive grant. Is, am I correct in stating that? Not yet, not yet. Okay. We hope to do that in another round. Okay. <laughs> so we're happy again uh, to be a part of your uh, colloquium. Um, I have a brief presentation that I'm gonna present on. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen, everyone? Uh, it's not coming up. Katie, can, can you help us with this? Let's see. It was working earlier. Can you see the share screen? Are you able Are to you see the share, share screen? screen? I did. I select. Hmm. Oh, maybe. There we there go. We all right, now we're getting there. We go. Okay. Okay. So I wanted to introduce the program contacts. Um, as you stated earlier, Dr. Vicki Robinson serves as a, a division director for the HBCU PBI division. Um, Vicki is also on the on the line, line participating today as well. P, um, for the PBI formal grant program. Shakira Davy and I, and I both to serve as co-leads for the program. So we do all of the information, or we receive all of the um, phase one data and we um, calculate the formula, we send out the award letters and everything that's contained to the program. Okay, some questions were sent to the department on what you wanted us to present on. So I have um, in this presentation, I will go over the program history, the program goals, the program grantee information and program, program outcomes. Disregard the typo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, for the program history, the, um, the PDF formula grant program is part, um, is instituted under the 20 USC 1059E. It is um, a, a Title III Part A grant and a, a set of Section 318. The first awards under the PBI formal grant program were made in um, FY 2010. Um, this is a fourth um, grant cycle that we're having under the PBI formula grant uh, program. The program came about as um, when I'm, I'm also, um, Shakira and I are both a part of the HBCU program. So mm -hmm. what happened, I mean, the power and the people, because there were several institutions that wanted to be a part of the HBCU program. However, mm -hmm. because of the, the history of the program and so forth, they could not be included in that program. So as a result of that, um, some, some individuals were very instrumental in going to the Hill and stating yep. that they wanted to be a part of the program. So it just shows the power, how you all can go and lobby for 
um, funding for different programs and and this and you made it happen. So yeah, and that, that's how the PBI formula grant became a part of the uh, um, um, Office of Post Secondary Education. Yeah. Um, so again, like I said, um, there have been times that again we've seen throughout the years the program because it's not one of our mandatory programs where there's guaranteed funding for the program. So the program again. Um, we have also seen budgets where they it comes across from the president's budget that they're going to zero out the program. So we're always um, I, I encourage you all to support the program. And like I said, it's something that we cannot do, but you all can go to support the program to say which wonderful outcomes you have from the program. Program goals. The PBI program again. It mirrors the HBCU program, so it's for strengthening the, your institution. It's to serve low and middle income Black Americans. It's to encourage college preparation and persistence in retaining the students and to ensure that they will um, graduate and to support financial literacy for students. This cycle for the PBI formula grant program that we made in FY 2021, we awarded the most grantees that we've ever awarded for the PBI formula grant program. Mm -hmm. This in 2021, we awarded 40 grantees. So here are the 40 grantees that are part of the, the award that made the award cycle for 2021. It, might I add, it initially was 20 and then they, you know, they increased it to 40. So that's a huge blessing for those institutions. Absolutely. Yes, as Shakira stated, we, um, the con Congress, um, and when we made awards in 2016, we only made 11 awards, um, which one institution um, decided to become a graduate institution only. So we, they, were, um, they were removed from funding. So when Congress saw that, they were like, okay, when we were about to make the awards, we initially had made awards for 20. And then they were like, okay, are you sure that we can't um, look back at the program to make sure that we're awarding the, absolutely everyone that we can? So when we did, when we went back to look at the eligibility, 40 were eligible to receive funding. So I'm gonna flip through these slides. I included everyone of the 40 and the, the funding for 2021 was 14 million, 218,000. Again, there's a formula used to calculate the awards. And so like it, it's based on the data of all of the institutions that are in the funding population, which again was 40. PBI program outcomes. The success stories that I, that I can recall for the program as far as I, um, I, there are several institutions, um, which Trinity University is one of them, um, Heinz Community College, Atlanta Technical College, and also Southeast Tex Tennessee Community College. Heinz, um, when they received the formula grant program, uh, they were instrumental in um, using the funding to support um, the, the SNAP program recipients. And so the, those, uh, um, they created a program that was a one-stop shop where they were able to, you know, to, um, to enroll those students, to support them, in areas where they were, you know, deficient and so forth, and to help them because those um, individuals had, you know, um, they were of the low income population. And um, another success story from Heinz Community College was, um, and um, I believe it was 2017, they, um, Heinz Community College purchased um, 3D printers. And um, Nissan had a shortage and they could not produce a part. And so for, so therefore they used those um, 3D printers to make uh, parts that Nissan could not support. Um, and they had to figure out how to make this certain part. And they were instrumental in using 3D printers to produce that part. So they helped Nissan in a crunch when they, with those 3D printers, they taught that, you know, um, they taught how, uh, the students how to use those 3D printers. And so they were able to be successful in that. Trinity University, they have used the funding for, um, as you know, for your nursing program. Mm -hmm. I still have not gotten an opportunity, you know, to get out there to see the lab that you all have. Uh, ho I'm hoping that we one day will be able to do that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Atlanta Technical College. I had an opportunity to do a site visit at Atlanta Technical College, and they did such wonderful things with the funding that they created um, an awesome lab. I mean, I was so impressed with that, and I wish I could have given them given them more funding because with the six hundred thousand or so that they received, they were able to do wonderful things. Because Atlanta Technical College also had a competitive grant as well as as well as having the PBI formula grant program. So they also used that funding to leverage other funding for be um, from the United States um, um, Armed Forces and so forth. So they're. Um, they have other grant opportunities that are really, um, going on with that because of the PBI formula grant program. Southeast Texas, Tennessee Community College, they also did uh, had a wonderful program that they encouraged um, um, individuals that were uh, Black African-American males that were incarcerated to um, encourage them to, um, you know, enter the, you know, to college to be able to um, support themselves and so forth with uh, the program that they had at their institution. And that um, the, the, they were able to go on to get a certificate and to be productive citizens and for, the, for um, the state of Tennessee. So they had an awesome program. Those are the programs I, I, can, I can highlight because I'm aware of them. And like I said, some of them, I got you know, exclusive knowledge of, of those programs. And, and Katie mentioned it earlier, it's, it's mainly about student participation, student engagement. You know, on my side, I, I've noticed a common denominator, which is, you know, students just need to be occupied. They need to feel engaged and they just want, you know, they, 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 they are looking for this. They, they want these opportunities. And so during the pandemic, I've noticed an increased, you know, um, computer lab usage and, you know, just iPads, just technologies being made available to the students, which has helped because a lot of students, you have the other side where some students dropped out or, you know, they may not, you know, continue to, you know, you know, with the education, but with these programs or with this program specifically, giving money to these institutions, allowing these kids to stay in school, stay online and, and, and keep them engaged. Hey. Thank, well, thank you. And, and that's all I have as far as a presentation. Um, at this time, if you have any questions or so forth that you want to ask Shakira or me, um, you can ask the questions and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Yeah. So um, before I tell you about the Trinity model, and I hope you'll stay on to hear about the Trinity model, just let me ask from our audience, are there any questions that we have uh, right now? about this program and about what um, our friends Bernadette and Shakir just told us. No questions yet, but there will be questions, I'm sure, after, after um, the, the rest of the presentation about how Trinity and Bernadette and Shakir, um, uh, you will hear me in the next set talk about our desire to lobby Congress for increased funding. So I hope that's okay with you that we're saying that you don't have to do that, we have to do that, right? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. We we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so above our pay grade. We're, we're barred from doing that. Yeah. Gonna, absolutely. Like I said, off the record, I can tell you all that it's you you can definitely do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't be alarmed. So so uh, part of this came. You remember we had the conversation of when it went from twenty institutions to forty institutions, and and the grants were actually cut back. You know, hooray for the forty schools but Congress should have added to the appropriation, right? So, but, but let me, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the Trinity model because then we can bring these two presentations together. And I'm so grateful to you um, for your presentation because it really tees up this um, very nicely. So this presentation is reflections on five years of Trinity's predominantly black institution program grants. And we've just been so grateful for them and how this program contributed to systemic change at Trinity in the way we teach our sciences and the way we teach nursing. So um, this uh, funny old picture shows you, uh, oops, I, I went too quickly. Um, this is Trinity's original science lab back in 1920. <laughs> sciences were always part of education at Trinity and uh, Bernadette and Shakir, uh, you may or may not know this, we're celebrating 125 years this year. Um, and Trinity was founded as one of the nation's first Catholic women's colleges 
And of course, back in the day, um, uh, whether you know uh, we do our history well or not, we know that the students um, originally at Trinity and up through many generations were all white students, white Catholic students. And that's why the PBI participation is so important for us today. Um, I talk about Trinity scientists across the generations. Back in the early days, it was sisters in full habit who were the scientists. And you see today, uh, today's students using the same model, it looks like of Adams, I guess. Uh, so I thought that was pretty cool to put those two pictures together because the tradition of science continues at Trinity with new generations. We had an old science building that today's students will not even remember. However, I think our scientists remember it all too well. Um, when it was opened in 1940, it was uh, the bee's knees of that generation back in the day. Um, but by the time we got up to 2016, that building had outlived its usefulness. Many classes in that old building were outstanding scientists. You see all these women in their lab coats. They were all Trinity students in the 1950s. You notice also they were all white because Trinity only began to integrate in the late 1950s. And that's a topic, by the way, that Dr. Kimberly Monroe is leading the Trinity History Project as part of our Trinity DARE initiative to raise up Trinity's racial history and to talk about the racism that was here in the past, which we acknowledge and have to put right out there, and then how Trinity not only integrated, but then became a predominantly black institution. It is a fascinating story. And so today, fast forward, we see the women in the white coats today, a very different picture. Those white coats are on our nursing students. That was part of the white coat program. And over here, we also see some of our students in the Claire Booth Loose Science Scholars. These are all Claire Booth Loose Scholars. So Trinity has changed dramatically, but our excellence in the sciences continues. And the excellence in the sciences has extended also to nursing. But we also knew back in the day in that old building, we had equipment that was kind of old. You see here images of the old monocular uh, microscopes and those microscopes, the slides had to be illuminated with gooseneck lamps. Um, and we were still struggling with that. I think some of the faculty remember some of those struggles uh, and we knew we couldn't continue. We did get some new microscopes. You see more recent photo of the microscopes covered up. These were binocular microscopes, but you see the old lab there that students may not have known, but these were very old laboratories, uh, no air conditioning, old heat system, um, old electrical systems. So we knew we had to do something. Um, and at the same time, as we started thinking about a new science building, we had started the nursing program in 2010. And you can't see it all here, but these students are gathered down in the basement of Alumni Hall, right. which was the old nursing lab. And we had to get donated nursing beds and donated mannequins from the hospitals. We couldn't afford to buy our own equipment. And our first generation of nursing students uh, learned on the donated stuff down in the old basement. So, so we knew that we had to fix that problem too. We conceptualized this beautiful new academic center where we're sitting today um, and where we hope Bernadette and Shakir can visit at some point, the Trinity, the Payton Center, the Trinity Academic Center. And in order to build that, uh, well, in order, we created that center because we didn't want to continue in these old dark laboratories. I think some of the scientists will remember these old dark laboratories. Uh, we wanted to bring our students into new modern laboratories. And you see one of our new modern laboratories there and coming out of darkness into light, you know? I mean, it was pretty dramatic, wouldn't you say? Um, but as we did that, oh, here's another picture. We realized that modern science, including nursing education, needed more sophisticated instrumentation. You see this old picture from the 1940s and 50s of an anatomy lab. Dr. Ray will appreciate this where they put the bones out on the table. But we knew that we couldn't continue to teach that way. We had to have a modern anatomy lab. And you see that here with the models and the clay and, and all of that that the students use today. Um, we had a lot of old stuff. So we built our new building but we had a lot of old stuff in the old building. You see some of the old stuff sitting here. And I think uh, Dr. Zooks in particular may remember that as we looked at the old stuff and thought of the equipment we needed in the new building, what did I say, Dr. Zooks? No old no, stuff in our new building, building. <laughs> <laughs> right? We could not bring all that old equipment over. It didn't make any sense to have a beautiful new building. 
but we had a dilemma. How would Trinity be able to pay to outfit all of these new laboratories? We were so lucky to have a generous donor. Here's Joan Payton for whom this building is named. Joan is class of 53. She is a self-made entrepreneur. She was able to make a gorgeous gift of $10 million, but the building itself cost $35 million. So we had to pay for the rest of the building. Um, and then we still needed another $3 million or so to outfit the laboratories with new equipment. And the question was, how were we going to do that? And we found out in 2014, 15, 16, that Trinity was now officially a predominantly black institution. We probably were even a little earlier, but we only really realized that as we were building this new building. And that was when we became familiar with the predominantly black institution program at the US Department of Education. And our first grant over the course of five years uh, came out to a total of $2.75 million, almost $2.8 million. And we've just re-upped our, this is formula grant, not competitive grant, we hope to do that soon. Uh, we've just re-upped for a grant that will be valued over five years at, at a million dollars, 250 a year. So the sum total of approximately $4 million was absolutely the kind of grant support we needed in order to be able to outfit the laboratories, train the faculty, and help the students in this new building. Now, you might ask, how did Trinity, you remember those pictures of the very white students, the very white laboratories, how did Trinity become a predominantly black institution? This is one of the great stories in American higher education today. And I'm very proud of this story. And it's one that other institutions need to learn about. Um, starting, I went back just to 1980. So starting in 1980, um, the green part is our enrollment of black students. And the red part is the enrollment of Hispanic students. And then the purple is Trinity's total enrollment. We only had 783 students here in 1980 and only 19% of those students were black or African-American and only 5% were Latina. So this was still very much in 1980, a predominantly white institution. Fast forward and you see this dramatic rise from 1990 to the year 2000, from 20% black students to 64% black students. And you might say, how did that happen? This was a period of great strategic planning for Trinity and strategic refocusing. And during those years, we determined that for Trinity to, to grow and thrive in the future, Trinity should focus on the educational needs of women in the, in the District of Columbia and, and Washington region, that our future as an academic institution was absolutely tied integrally to the future of educating the women of this city. And that was when this great demographic change began for Trinity as we began to welcome more and more students from the DC public schools, the DC charter schools and our local region. While that was happening, the other thing that happened was the DC tuition assistance grant program came into being in the year 1999. And that program, which is funded by Congress, made it possible for students who came to Trinity from DC to get a little bit of funding. It's only $2,500, but it's, it's you know, it means everything to um, a grant from the, the the program to enroll at Trinity along with their Pell Grants and other grants. So that rise was driven by that. Over the years, you see this line changes a little bit and today we're 54%. And you might say, well, why did it go from a high of 69 to 54% African-American? Um, the numbers did not change all that much, but what happened was when we started with the DREAM program in 2014, our enrollment of Hispanic students began to accelerate. So today we have a larger proportion of Latina women here um, who are largely um, our undocumented students through the dream.us and others. And that just changed, the numbers changed the proportion as all of the math majors know, that <laughs> the proportions all change. Um, and our enrollment has gone down a little bit during the pandemic, but, but it will come back again. And I am pretty confident that we will remain um, as we are today, both a predominantly
That's been made possible by a lot of the new equipment and technology as well. We also know in nursing that we are enrolling many more nursing students and those nursing students are graduating in large number and securing not only great first line jobs, but residencies that are quite prestigious at area hospitals. And perhaps the greatest thing I can say that the PBI program can take full responsibility for with the nursing faculty is that our NCLEX scores rose first time pass rate to 100% last year, and it fluctuates between 90 and 100%. But that is an outcome that is stellar and just amazing. And it's thanks to being able to have the sim lab and the other nursing equipment. Uh, the PPI grant works in parallel with these other grants. I won't read all of this, um, but uh, for example, it works with the HHMI faculty development. It works with the Claire Booth Loose, Booth Loose support. Those other programs help us to buy some equipment, uh, but the, the PPI grant has also helped us to leverage other support. So for example, we received this year, thanks to Patrice Moss, a $250,000 grant from the Sloan Foundation as part of the Equitable Pathways Program into graduate school. And we're doing that in partnership with Johns Hopkins University, very prestigious. And I don't think we could have done that if we hadn't been in the PBI program. So it leverages one to another. Our participation in the Capital Code Lab made it possible to develop our data analytics program. Again, the success that PBI has fostered has fostered our success now going into information technology programs and our new PBI grant this year is funding a new position on the faculty that will be specifically for information technology programs. So that is, that is huge. Our dual enrollment programs, we heard yesterday from some of our high school students, dual enrollment, early college, all made possible initially through our first PBI grant, supporting the development of those programs here. And now we work in partnership with OSSI and DCPS and DC Charters um, and we're enrolling more and more students. And you might say, why, are, why is college enrolling high school students? To get those students on the pathways to success. All of the data tells us that early enrollment in college contributes to better retention and better outcomes for students in college. And we're seeing that here. Um, so uh, continued partnership. We have a partnership with American University and the DC NASA Space Grant Program. And that is, is also supported by PBI. We received uh, important private funding for our environmental studies program. There again, the PBI grant helps to leverage that. We received a special grant from the Henry Luce Foundation for this colloquium, which is all part of that. So you see one grant leverages others. That's in fundraising, the name of the game is leverage, right? And we're always leveraging, leveraging. Here you see Bill Conway in the middle with some of the 140 nursing students he supports. Bill Conway, the Conway Scholarship Program is $2 million a year. That program is possible because Bill is so proud of what Trinity is doing in nursing. And part of why he's proud is that 100% nursing pass rate on NCLEX. And that NCLEX pass rate would not have been possible without the PBI's funded laboratory. So you see, we built the laboratories, we got the PBI funding, we got all the mannequins, the nursing students, the, the faculty do well, the students do well, and then everybody's happy, right? And we get more money. And that's the way this works. That's what my job is, is to figure out how to keep everybody happy so they'll keep giving us money. That's why we're doing this. Um, you also see here the PBI grant program made it possible for us to do the early college program. PBI supported the first two years of planning with the DC public schools. And you see right here, this picture is our very first cohort of students from Coolidge High School in the early college program. You see them around on campus. They're high school juniors, soon to be seniors. They love the program, they're doing so well. We heard students talk yesterday about how they just feel so proud and so respected to be here on this campus doing that. And this was made possible by PBI. I hope Bernadette and Shakir, I hope you're feeling very proud of all of this. So we did a study because our, my interest, uh, I've talked about leverage. My interest is in how we can get um, the PBI program to grow uh, and not just for Trinity, but for all the universities who participate. But we did a little bit of study here and we went into um, 2020 IPEDS data. IPEDS is the federal reporting system that all universities have to report through. So in federal IPEDS and uh, Bernadette and Shakir, um, if you have different data, I'm happy to get it, but this is what we found. We looked at all PBI institutions and there's 64 PBIs 
in it. Of all of those 64, there are 10 that are private four-year institutions like Trinity. And there are three who are private and uh, PBIs and Hispanic serving. So there's only three of us in the country. Uh, it's Trinity, it's Bloomfield College, and I'm blanking on the other, but I'll remember it soon. We also looked by comparison at the HBCUs because as Bernadette told us, the PBI program grew in response to formerly predominantly white institutions that had become predominantly black saying we need more help to support our students. And uh, so there's 100 HBCUs of that 146 are private HBCUs. And you might say, well, what's the difference between private and public? Well, you know, in higher ed, the, the private institutions, um, we get federal financial aid and federal grants, but we don't get uh, state funding, if you will, in the states. The public institutions are funded in part by their states, um, but not the private institutions. But HBCUs get the special uh, stipend from the federal government, and that's what the PBI program is. Well, fast forward over here. So we looked at things like what the percentage of, of Black and Pell Grant students is, uh, and then and Trinity's percentage, 61% of our students are Pell Grantees in 2020. We add about 10% to that who are not eligible for Pell, but they are undocumented students. Um, so our percentage of needy students is very high. 54% of our students are Black. We looked at the average enrollment among these, and then we looked at the outcomes. And here's the part that I'm very proud of. Uh, although we can always do better and we want to get these percentages up over 50%. In fact, at Trinity, 46% um, of our, our students graduate within six years. Um, we need that to get up to 55 or 60%, but nationally the number is about 53%, so we're not that far behind. Um, but compared to the other averages, we're doing much better on graduation. Same with Black students. Now, I don't think there should be any variance here, so at 41%, we can do certainly a lot better. Um, and then the graduation rate for Pell grantees at 45%. If you look at each category, Trinity's percentage of graduation is higher than the average percentages of the institutions in the other categories. And this is really important to make the case that, that Trinity is making progress and we can do better, but we stand out in the group as being above average on uh, measures that funders and grant makers and politicians think are very, very important. I know we don't have the historical data here, but I know that those numbers were not so good before we got the PBI program and before we got this beautiful facility, that those numbers were down in the 30s. So we have made substantial progress. The Inclusive Excellence Program helped us with HHMI but I cannot understate the importance of the PBI program in helping us to raise our completion rates, which is everything when, when I go to testify in front of Congress and they say what. Um, so we're proud to be one of the best in the group. Um, what, are we, what are we asking for now? Well, my final comment is we have this initiative called Trinity Dare, Driving Actions for Racial Equity, um, and there are a number of components in it. One of the most important things I think Trinity Dare says is that we want to widen career pipelines for our students of color who need to be at the tables and welcomed into professional channels where students of color, women of color historically have not been, have not been welcomed. And that's in the sciences, that's in business, that's in healthcare. You know, one of the things that was startling to me to discover as we, as we went into the PBI program only 10% of the licensed nurses in this country are black. Um, I had no idea that the number was so low, the proportion was so low. And we've had uh, presidents and chief nursing officers from the regional hospitals here in the Washington region say, Trinity is literally changing the demographics of their hospital workforce um, because of the number of black and Hispanic students we send forth from Trinity into the workforce. We want to do the same with the technology workforce. I never want some of those guys in the tech in Amazon or other places ever again not to invite our students to the table. I want us at the table. The science students need to be at the table. Um, the business majors need to be at the table. So, so that's what the PBI program is, is about. That's what Trinity Dare is all about. We work together. So my goal here is um, to uh, use this data and use this kind of backdrop to start a more intensive lobbying effort up at Congress. And we have a few friends in Congress 
I think we know the Speaker of the House. We know a few <laughs> others, but being part of the District of Columbia, we have no voting representatives. So we have to use the goodwill of other people in Congress uh, to leverage this great outcome to see if we can get more funding for the predominantly black institutions program so that we can continue to thrive. All of this great equipment that we were able to get into Trinity someday will need to be replaced because equipment you know, ages. Uh, all of the great work we've done, new faculty will come and we'll need additional training. So at any rate, that's, that's the PBI program. That's what we're doing. And I'm going to stop there and ask um, uh, Bernadette or Shakir, do you have any comments on any of that? And then I'll open for questions. Um, no, no comments are, I'm just actually impressed. <laughs> I was, uh, just, I was like kind of mesmerized by, you know, everything that has been going on at the institution. And um, I don't know about Bernadette, but I definitely wouldn't mind visiting one day <laughs> to see that lab and just see what you have going on. I was impressed. <laughs> so yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> I, I, I do not have any additional comments. Uh, for me as well, I'm always impressed uh, with the PBI program. It started as a small program and to see you know the accomplishments that you all have made, it makes me very proud to be a part of the PBI program. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, well, we appreciate your joining us this morning and um, your support has made it possible for us to be successful and we will welcome you to campus. Uh, let's make a time when you can come on up uh, and see for yourselves. Uh, and then also um, we will continue to be uh, activists in trying to enlarge the funding. Any comments or questions from our audience? I know our next panel is about to start, but I'm happy to answer anything. I think they're just waking up and that's probably more than enough. Right. But let's let's thank Bernadette and Shakir for all of their help. Thank, thank you all again, uh, like as I stated. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to when we can schedule a time to actually come up. Um, Dr. Vicki Robinson, she wanted to be there today with you all to be there I'm on campus. So, <laughs> so yeah. um um, I'm looking forward to us when we all, the three of us can come up to see what you all have accomplished. Great. Thank we you. Can make that happen. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you both. So have a good rest of the day. See you now. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.